My name is Dr. Rulani Edward Nguenya, um, and today we'll be speaking about flaps. It's a big topic. There's much to cover. Um, the assumption, as always, is that there's basic principles and content, and my job is just to, to touch on the main points. Um, so this is not to replace your learning. But just to give you an overview and crystallize that which is already there. What is a flap? Let's start there. Come from the Dutch word flappe, F-L-A-P-P-E, double P-E. Um, and in essence, it's anything that's hung, broad and loose um, and fastened by one side, which we call the pedicle, that side where the blood supply comes from. Um, Taylor... Um, there's an article actually that it would be great to have a look at by Taylor, where he looked at angiosomes. Um, and what in essence um, he discovered is that there are certain areas in the body that um, are perforated um, or rather perfused um, in specific segments, if one may use that term. Um, so we, we speak of angiosomes and peferosomes. And what is an angiosome? It's just a composite unit of skin and its underlying tissue that is supplied by a single sourced artery and its branches. Um, and these were initially studied, of course, by um, Mankoch in 1889. But um, Taylor and Palmer, which is an article I would recommend that you read, um, that was uh, that he looked at and um, expanded on the works of Salman um, in in the 1930s. So I think 1987, Taylor and Palmer. There's an article where he describes um, and says, in our body we have about 40 angiosomes, and these are all interconnected by these um, choke vessels um, or these two. Um, and estomotic vessels that we have in between. So in um, on average, we have about 4.7 cutaneous angiosomes um, per source artery that's in our body. And if you if you go further into it um, with the, in regards to perforators, um, you will discover that we have on average about 200 arterial perforators of which 40% are direct and 60% are indirect. So that's a lot around the body. And we can use this to our benefit when raising arteries, I mean, uh, flaps. Um, remember, we don't go blindly just using a Doppler, but there's some science um, to assist us in this process. Let's just understand a bit of anatomy um, when we speak about a, a, a artery and when we speak about a vein. Um, perhaps we can define angiosomes um, or the territory anatomically, you can do so, by just the area that the vessels um, ramifies, basically, before anastomosing with each other. But you can define it dynamically by injecting, you know, um, fluorescein and looking at the intravascular um, you know, perfusion of that area using a, a light. So anatomically, you can, you can, you know, define it and also dynamically you can do so. But what is an, you know, um, an artery and what are the characteristics? According to Taylor, he says, look, an artery, it's something that travels with a nerve. It follows the law of equilibrium. In other words, if one is small, the neighboring will usually be large. It's fixed, um, you know, from um, a, 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 a mobile tissue um, and it goes to a fixed um, area or a tissue, almost like your muscle. Um, there's an origin, there's an insertion fixed to a mobile um, area. The, um, the, 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 the size of the vessels vary um, and that's just a product of growth and differentiation. Veins in themselves, well, there's a vena comitantes, um, which would define as a vein that goes parallel to the vessel. It may be one, usually accompanied, there are two of them, um, and they go and perfuse a particular area, uh, I mean, well, um, drain a particular area that is perfused by the accompanying vein. 
but a, a characteristics of veins, they can be valvular or avalvular. Remember, we've got veins, um, and usually the ones that are directional will have um, valves, but they are oscillating very, you know, veins in between, and those usually are avalvular. Let's look at perforators. You know, um, Nakajima spoke about six um, vessel types. And um, I think we touched on them when we looked at uh, wound healing, actually. If you go back to that lecture, you will then um, be able to see those. But they, in essence, there are three direct, um, you know, and three perforators. So direct cutaneous, direct septocutaneous, and then you get, um, you know, septocutaneous perforators, myocutaneous perforators, and then you get these direct cutaneous, which is a branch of a muscular vessel, or perforator cutaneous, which is a branch of the muscular, um, you know, vessel. So direct cutaneous, direct septocutaneous, myocutaneous, uh, or septocutaneous perforators, and then a direct branch from the muscle or a perforator from um, the muscle. I will, perhaps let's just succinctly say with direct um, perforators, it originates from a source artery, and which is usually um, lower down, and it pierces this deep fascia without transversing the deeper structures and goes directly there. Whereas um, with indirect, it first passes through an intermediary structure before it causes the deep fascia. So it may pass through muscle, which is the most common. Um, so that's what we mean by direct and indirect. Let's quickly classify our flaps. So we can divide our flaps into myocutaneous. Remember we spoke about it's going through um, the, 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 the muscle, so we can classify them myocutaneous or as fasciocutaneous. Matthews and Nahai classifies both of them. There's a fasciocutaneous classification of Matthews and, and Nahai, which is type A, B, and C. Type A, direct cutaneous perforators. Type B, septocutaneous perforator. Type C, myocutaneous perforator so type a your direct cutaneous perforators like we'd find in our scalp uh, or temporal parietal fascia our um, you know um groin flap your superior circumflex um superficial circumflex iliac arteries these are direct cutaneous but they are the septocutaneous such as the scapula, deltoid your radial um forearm you know your posterior interosseous um, your ALT in 38% of the patient, medial and lateral plantar artery, these are septocutaneous perforators. And then there's the myocutaneous, um, such as, you know, your, your, your delta pectoral, um, which is your Parkinson second intercostal space, which first goes through then that muscle, the pectoralis, um, and goes and supplies the skin there. So there's your thoraco epigastric um, that you can use your your ALT in 82%, uh, median forehead, our forehead flap, remember, nasolabial flap. Nasolabial is an interesting flap, um, but I'll just start it there because there's controversy there. If it is axial or actually just a random flap um, as facial flaps, which are five to one ratios, um that you can raise so there's comic and lombardi classification um also that we we you should know about um and in essence comic and lombardi um classify them into type a b c and d flaps type a multiple perforators um like your pontent flap that you'd use you know um or your 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 Type B, which is just a solitary perforator. You are using just this one perforator, and then you can maybe even propeller it around there. Um, and then type C, they are segmental perforators. 
um, and uh, those often you'd see lower limb, it's usually segmental there, um, and osteomyocutaneous flap uh, is type D. So multiple perforators, um, your solitary perforator, your segmental perforator, and your osteocutaneous perforator. Now, there are also myocutaneous flap, which in methods and are high classified based on their blood supply. Let's go into those. What are those? Now, there's type 1 to type 5. Type 1 um, is a muscle that has one dominant pedicle. This is like your, 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 your tensor fascia lata, um, your, your sural, um, or rather, um, you know, e, e vessels that come out there feeding in to the gastrocnemius. Gastrocnemius is a type 1 muscle. Um, there's also then your, your type 2, which have a dominant pedicle or pedicles, like in the soleus, with your popliteal on top branch and your, um, you know, posterior uh, or peroneal branches, the two dominant and then other um, minor pedicles going down. So, so that's usually the commonest type, um, but they have, you know, dominant pedicle and then minor pedicles. Gracilis is another example of this. Then we've got two dominant. So remember, type one, one dominant, type two, dominant or dominant um, pedicles um, and one minor and type three two dominant pedicles what muscles have those pectoralis minor your serratus um, with your um, you know e, 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 your epigastric inferior epigastric and superior epigastric vessels those are two dominant um, rectus abdominis, temporalis, gluteus maximus with your superior and inferior. Um, those are some of your dominant um, type 3 muscles. Type 4 muscles, segmental supply, um, your sartorias. In fact, if you look at your lower leg, your entire lower leg, bar, of course, your soleus muscle, your gastrocnemius, but most lower leg muscles are all segmental blood supply. Um, and then, of course, so you know when you take it, um, you may compromise your blood supply. And so it might be better, such as your, um, let's say, your tibialis anterior. What could you do? You could maybe split the muscle in half and only use a certain portion of the muscle. Um, but, of course, you, 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 those are just some of the techniques you can use. And then the last type 5 muscle is one dominant pedicle and multiple segmental supply. And classical examples, your pectoralis, um, major muscle, as you know, um, your latissimus dorsi um, in muscle is, is another one with your thoracodorsal, but multiple other, um, you know, segmental supplies, your, inter, um, your internal oblique is another which you can use. So those are musculocutaneous flaps. Um, there is another classification, the Taylor classification um, that he uses for muscle based on the innervation, type 1 to type 4. Um, type 1, it's one single nerve and it branches within the muscle. Type 2, it's a single nerve that branches before entering the muscle. Type 3, multiple nerves but from the same trunk. And type 4 is just segmental nerve supply. And this is Taylor. Type 1, single nerve within the muscle like your latissimus dorsi. Type 2, you know, it's, it's a single nerve but branches before, just like your vastus lateratus. And then type 3, multiple like your serratus anterior, which comes from the same trunk. And your segmental supply, of course, um, like your rectus abdominis um, muscle. So... Um, we've classified our flaps. Now let's speak about um, our perforator flaps. Um, you know, most of this nomec in nomenclature, or rather um, the definitions, came in September 29, 2001, um, in, in, the, in Ghent. Um, there was the Ghent consensus in Belgium where we, we discussed the perforator flaps. 
Um, and how do we define them? Um, succinctly, there are six definitions. Um, a perforator is a flap consisting of skin and or subcutaneous fat. Um, the vessel that supplies this um, are, are isolated perforators, which may pass either through or between the deep tissues, which are mostly muscles. Remember, we spoke about those. And we said that there are three different types, indirect muscle perforator, indirect septal, or direct cutaneous. Many other classifications, um, which, but I think from this definition, we are able to understand what a, 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 a perforator um, you know, is. There are special types, um, flap types, which are important to know. And um, these are things like prefabrication, um, which was spoken by, you know, introduced by Shen in 1982. Um, and this is, it's, it's, it's basically a two-stage technique um, in which a flap is, is surgically altered. So we create this um, specialized composite flap by partial elevation. Um, we may then expand underneath, you know, manipulation and incorporate other tissues. Um, and we allow these to heal and we delay transfer. So we would encase it in a pedicle or a sheet and usually um, a Gore-Tex. But um, by eight weeks, then we should be able um, to have neovascularization um, that can happen. So that's prefabrication. There's pre-lamination, um, which was, I think, coined the first time, I think, by um, pre and Fine in, in 94. And um, I like to think of it, let's say, a nose. You know, you preform this composite um, you, and you, you, you put a scaffold and transfer it as a complete unit. So you, you maybe here is a forehead flap. We take the cartilage, um, we make this composite, we reshape the nose on the forehead, um, allow it to take, give it time, and then we move it then later on. Another concept I would like us to just remember, you know, there are composite flaps. Um, we spoke about them, that they incorporate skin, fat, fascia, muscle, bone um, as a solitary, you know, or basically on a solitary blood supply or solitary pedicle. Um, and this allows for a single stage um, movement. But you can also have chimeric flaps. Um, scapula um, is one of the examples that are used. Fibula you can use, um, but these are just... Um, Hanok, you know, said that there are multiple flap territories, um, each with its um, independent vascular supply. Um, look, they are independent um, of each other, um, but they are linked by a common source or mother vessels. And these can be intrinsic, um, like your perforator flap, based um, or branch based or your fabricated one sequential or internal i won't go too much into chimeric it's important to know about it and maybe just to draw a chimeric flap um would be good i think one thing we can look at quickly is um your your five c's of a flap um so when we classify flaps when you think of a flaps there are these five c's that you can use um, and they're simple at least helping you to be able to define um, uh, or classify the flap and the five c's are circulation composition contiguity meaning area close by contiguity contour and conditioning so what is circulation? Let's start there. Circulation looks at the, the blood supply, the pedicle. Are you taking it from a known vessel or something that is not known? In other words, if it's known, it's an axial, it's a named artery. Or it can be random, there where there's no directional blood supply that is known. Um, and it's not based basically on a known, a known vessel. In the lower extremity, we know that as a one-to-one -one ratio. In the face, 
um, six to one, so I may say five to one um, ratio, but we know in the lower limb, Ponten then came, said, no, look, how about we try it, um, you know, but it actually can work by increasing it to 2.5 by one, um, accepted, we say three to one, um, on specific conditions, which you must know of um, as content, but this is not the brief of this, but it's specific that you must take the fascia. It must be proximally based. So there are specific conditions of for, for a content flap. So in circulation, random or axial. Composition, we spoke about. It can be cutaneous, fascial cutaneous, fascial, myocutaneous, muscle only, osteocutaneous, osseous only. So this is the composition. Then contiguity, what's next to it? Is it a local flap? These are tissues adjacent to the defect. Are they regional, which are in the same region of the body, or distant flap? And distant flap can be either on a free flap basis transfer or pedicled to its blood supply. Then there's contour, which is the ways that you can move a flap in essence. Um, and I, I, what can you do? It's, it's, it's actually, you, you know, you can either advance, so it's advancement flap. You can transpose, so flip from one side, um, almost on a rectangular platform, to another side. So that's a transposition. We can rotate. Um, a flap, as the word mentions it, the geometry is important therein, or interpolation, like maybe even an advancement or a transposition flap, but this flap passes over um, or under a bridge of intact skin, like your forehead flap, it would go over the, you know, a bridge before reaching maybe the nose, um, the tip of the nose, for example. Those are the, 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 the different contour um, classification where you can put it on. And then conditioning. You know, conditioning, um, quite an, an important aspect um, of a flap. And in essence, conditioning speaks about how can we manipulate, um, you know, biology in order to get more from our flap with less um you know trauma and blood he called it supply in inverted commas and the way we do it um conditioning you may delay okay we speak of flap delay um which i think let we'll get into that it's an important topic to know and then expansion um where we expand and hudson will tell you of the principles of expansion so in essence increasing um an error such as the scalp you can increase about 50% of the other scalp and then get, you know, be able to advance that. Um, and with the flap, we always know that um, usually it, it may shrink, you lose 20%. So in this, um, you know, what we want to do is to, to increase our, 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 our oxygenation, our perfusion um, of this larger flap with um, a lesser call it in inverted commas as i'll explain more blood um supply or vasculature so let's speak about delay since we are here what is delay you know delay is the surgical interruption of a portion of blood supply um and it's just you do that to a flap at a preliminary stage before we transfer it and there's postulations that go into this and theories of how it can increase. And we will go into that. I'll tell you more about it. But we can divide delay into two types of delay. There's the standard delay where we can cut around um, a tissue. We interrupt the blood supply by cutting around the periphery and then partially elevating the flap. Um, or we can delay it strategically. So it's standard or strategic. Strategic, um, big example used, common example is the tram flap, where you can then just um, first before elevating, you go and you dissect or you divide um, a specific pedicle to a flap to improve the, 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 the blood supply or the dependence 
form only that that one pedicle that's there. So let's let's talk about um, you know delay, and 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 how delay actually actually helps us the pathophysiology of delay. So there are two theories um, of delay, and one you know is about conditioning the flap. So one says conditioning that by doing so you condition the tissue to ischemia. So you allow it to survive on less nutrient um, flow than it's used to. The other says, not only do you condition, you also improve um, or increase the vascularity through many different mechanisms which we will go into. So how do we condition? Remember, what happens with conditioning is that we, 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 we get... Um, this um, vascular, um, basically the, 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 the sympathetic nervous system um, under the influence of noradrenaline will then cause immediate vasoconstriction. This is, is described a lot by Gali in 2007 where he says you get this um, secondary to trauma um, in the surgery, you get this vasoconstriction um, due to this noradrenaline. There are other factors that cause vasoconstriction, such as your endothelin, endothelial derived contractive factors, um, thromboxin A2 that is released from damaged cells, um, your, your, your leukotriene B2, red blood cell hemoglobin. So all these things um, assist. But now, upon elevation of the flap, then you get vasodilatation due to the depleted noradrenaline. And, and so, um, and also because of nitric oxide. And so you've now conditioned this tissue to live on um, less blood supply. But also you've conditioned the tissue to, to decrease its metabolic requirements. Um, so this is how conditioning works. There's also hyperemia that you will get. Um, and, and, and the next phase that we spoke about is revascularization. How does that happen? I like to think of it in four phases, um, or four different areas that, that cause this. Number one, there's vessel reorientation. Remember, here's this vessel. We cut it at the periphery. So then there's now reorientation to an axial direction. So it goes and it supplies it in an axial direction. Then there's also neovascularization, which happens, and this is initiated by um, growth factors. So you get your vascular endothelial growth factors, fibroblast growth factors, and these initiate neovascularization. But also, as expressed by um, Da and Taylor, there's an increase in the diameter of choke vessels. And this in itself is what increases perfusion. And so they, they, they Ida and Taylor then classified this um, into four phases. They said, look, first phase, there's um, this vasospasm, which happens in the first 24 hours. But after 24 hours, we enter phase two, where after the vasospasm, we get vasodilatation. That happens, you know, within 24 to 78 hours. Then after we enter phase three, where now you get the wall that starts to thicken. So not only vasodilatation, but the wall in itself, um, after 78 hours, starts to thicken. But it's still reversible. Phase four, this wall thickening is now irreversible. And usually by seven, day seven, there's irreversible wall thickening of these choke vessels. And so now you perfuse much better. Another part that's mentioned is the AV shunting um, that is there and that would increase blood flow, um, you know, distal to the flap. Um, blood supply, but this is something that still has its controversies and not so well proven. Um, but 
It definitely the vascular reorientation into axial direction, neovascularization, and increased diameter of choke vessels um, is one of the areas that certainly affects this. So we've looked at our flaps, we've classified them, we've looked at the physiology of um, the of 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 our delay. Maybe the next thing we can look at is we've now taken this flap, we've applied it and we've put it onto the wound, but then the flap doesn't take. What are the factors that causes this flap to not um, perfuse well? So in other words, what is the pathophysiology of flap failure? Something very important to know. And there are two main factors that affect um, flap failure. And in essence, it's thrombosis and it's vasoconstriction. But all of these thrombosis and vasoconstriction all lead to one thing, which is ischemia. So what happens with ischemia? Ischemia then starts to, 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 to have an effect in two pathways. The first, with ischemia, it causes the production of oxygen-free radicals. And these, you know, are produced by your, your neutrophils through the xanthine oxidase, the high um, dehydrogenase pathways. Endothelin is one of the areas. Um, your platelets also um, through the NADPH pathway, you would have these oxygen free radicals, which are detrimental, um, you know, to our tissues. And this is one of the, 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 the causes of flap failure. You know, when we speak of oxygen free radicals already in your mind, um, you can start to think of how can we assist um, this or reverse this process um, of, of having these oxygen-free radicals. So now you can think of measures to, 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 to um, address, you know, flap failure. And, and some of those, because oxygen-free radicals is a mechanism that's also used by radiation, by the way, indirect radiation, because that's what radiation waves do when they come in contact with water. They cause these superoxide, oxygen-free radicals, peroxide, and all these byproducts then cause um, the radiation effect or the DNA killing of the cells. And so hyperbaric oxygen is something that then comes in to assist by increasing the perfusion. So for flap failure, um, this is one of the pathways. And now you can start thinking of other adjuncts that you can use. That, ah, if I give hyperbaric oxygen, perhaps I can use hyperbaric oxygen to salvage a flap that is failing. So that's one of the uses of hyperbaric oxygen on the, by the way. Now, what else does ischemia do? Ischemia in itself leads to local acidosis on the affected tissue. And so what is acidosis? That's increased, um, you know, um, hydrogen um, um, in the cells. So increase H plus in the cells. And so to counter this, what does the body do? Then there's a large influx of sodium into the cell in exchange of Hydrogen, remember, so that's what happens. So, in exchange of H, we get Na2, Na, which is sodium, and you get this exchange. But what does that do? It causes a tremendous influx of high levels of sodium, which are intracellular. But now that's a problem in itself. So, we need to exchange this and balance forces through the law of equilibrium. And how do we do that? By increasing calcium for this exchange. And so what does that do? The mitochondria are now damaged. What are mitochondria? We know what they do. So by mitochondria being damaged, you decrease ATP, and so you get cellular death. You get cell death, secondary to that acidosis, and trying to um, counter the acidosis. So this is another way. Oxygen-free radicals, the acidosis pathway, um, trying to correct it, which is another way um, of, of flap failure. 
And of course, you can start thinking now of ways to mitigate against this. So this is um, the, 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 the ways. And of course, there are other factors now with perfusion, your neutrophil in, in, in flux, your depletion of um, nitric oxide. All of these, they cause free radicals and um, apoptosis that then will then start to happen. So I think we've, we've covered most of the important things in, in a flap. Um, the, the next um, topic that we'll speak about um, will be flap monitoring. How do we monitor a flap? Um, how do we prevent, you know, um, flap failure? Or, or, or now when we've got flap failure, what are the things that we get into now? To, to, to stop this process and to go back, what are the measures we can, we can put in place and what are some of the pharmacological um, and biological, like your medical leashes, um, you know, adjuncts that we can use to assist us in this process. I thank you for your attention and I hope this has certainly worked to, 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 to just assist you to have an understanding of what flaps are, um, how we, what is the physiology of a flap, and how do we, um, knowing this physiology, um, use that to assist us in order to cover um, defects and make better use of the flaps to increase the coverage. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.